Alrighty. <laughs> well, this has been a bit of a journey for me, uh, a new way of lecturing and a new way of kind of thinking about how to teach you. Very integrated with the textbook. I've never been so integrated. It's always been two separate things, I think. Uh, and I'm curious how, how this is going to work out for you. I may actually ask you some questions uh, once you've had a taste of how different professors are doing online stuff, you know, how you think this compares. Uh, but we'll get to that. So this should be the last video in this chapter. Um, it, there'll be a couple of videos after it that are just people in your neighborhood. Uh, but this one, I kind of hope to wrap up um, the chapter and really kind of, you know, this will follow the clinical section where they kind of talk through the, the clinical stuff. Uh, and, you know, one of the stories that you kind of get is that starting from Freud on, that, that previous to Freud, the psychologists were primarily experimental psychologists. And so they were just trying to understand that sort of reverse engineering, right? Just trying to understand humans and how they work. And then along came Freud, who, um, who uh, was interested more in people that were having issues, um, challenges, mental challenges, and you know, starting to, to bring in the mental health side of psychology. But at that point, it kind of feels like psychology splits into two where the experimentalists continue doing their experimental thing, and then these clinicians start doing the helping people thing. But, you know, very often the experimentalists did not respect the clinicians based on the answer to this question. What makes something a science? The experimentalists did not believe that clinical psychology um, as they knew it was scientific. In fact, they were right. Um, the early clinical psychology was not scientific. So let's just talk about this a little bit. Uh, it was not scientific because it was not trying to be scientific. Uh, Sigmund Freud was a medical doctor. He was trained as a medical doctor, you know, and he's obviously the, the, the creator of the first therapeutic approach of psychoanalysis. And he came at this as a doctor comes at things. You know, think about going to a doctor. If, if you said, um, uh, doctor, I can't sleep. I'm having trouble sleeping. Can you help me? Uh, what would a doctor do? Well, they'd typically uh, prescribe medicine of some sort, right? Pills, drugs. So they would give you something. Um, and maybe a good doctor might call back in a few days or a week and say, hey, how's that working for you? And if you said, good, I'm sleeping better, then as far as the doctor is concerned, everything's fine here. Um, no reason to dig any deeper. This is how Freud did therapy. You know, Freud came up with all these ideas of um, that, that these issues were caused by psychological um, um, issues that the person had that were held deep in the unconscious. And he came up with this theory that says, if I can help people figure out what these things are and bring them to light and reach catharsis, then, that, then they'll feel better. And so he developed a whole therapy based on that. And so now if you came to Freud and you said, you know, I'm having these issues, he would say, okay, let's do it. And he would start giving you therapy. Uh, and he might ask you every now and then, by the way, is this therapy helping? And if you said, yep, yeah, I actually feel a little better um, since we've been talking, then as far as Freud was concerned, everything was fine. Okay, that's all that he needed to know. And that was also true, by the way, of some of the people that came after, even like Carl Rogers, who's doing a very different kind of therapy than Freud. Uh, and yet, you know, the ultimate sort of it's working for, for Carl Rogers was people saying, I feel a lot better. To scientists, this is not good enough. This is not evidence that your therapy works just because somebody says they feel better. There might be a million reasons why they say that, including maybe they're just trying to please you and make you happy. Or maybe they spent a lot of money on therapy and so they're making themselves feel like you know they've learned something. And so scientists kept pushing all the way through clinicians to provide some scientific data to support what they were doing. They often couldn't. And so experimental psychologists kept looking at clinical psychologists and Freud in general and in specific and saying, no, no, you guys are making a mess of psychology. Okay, so there was a, there was a real split um, that, that was happening. Now, fast forward to the present, June 2020. This summer, just a few months ago, the University of Toronto graduates its first graduates in clinical psychology. So when the University of Toronto officially opened its psychology department, 
um, man, I should have the date of this right at the top of my head. It, it should be early 1900s. Um, I have to go look up that. I'll look that up now. But they did not include a clinical psychology program. Students could not learn clinical psychology at the University of Toronto. Why? Because the University of Toronto considered psychology a science, but it didn't consider clinical psychology a science. And so it wasn't going to include it in what it taught. It was only going to stick to the scientific side of psychology. Obviously, this has changed. Why has this changed? Well, it's changed because as clinical psychology has matured, there has there, there's um, a recognition that there does need to be a science of clinical psychology. There does need to be people doing a proper analysis of therapeutic techniques. And so clinical psychology has become more scientific. Okay, what the heck does that mean? become more scientific. I've thrown this around a few times. I've talked about how math plays a role in making people think of something as a science, but let me give you the real answer now. Um, all right. There is something called the scientific method, and we're going to talk about it a lot in chapter two, but I want to give you a taste of it now already. Uh, and the idea is this. Um, these first three steps are sort of philosophy. And this next step is where psychology really kicks in. And I'm going to emphasize this step and everything that happens down here. But let's start here. You make observations. You're out in the world. You're seeing things. And, and every now and then, interesting questions pop into your mind. You know, maybe you're saying, you know what? I've met some Harry Potter people in my life. And it always seems like they haven't showered for a long time. And so maybe you actually formulate a hypothesis. You say, yeah, I think, I think people who like Harry Potter don't like to shower. There's, there's something, there's something about them. Um, and, and so I, th I, I believe that's true. Uh, mm, okay. Well, this is kind of where philosophy ends. You know, even William James that you heard about as the first American psychologist, he was more of a philosopher. Um, so philosophers sit and they observe and they think about things and they formulate ideas and that's it. They talk about their ideas. The line between philosophy and psychology is what happens next. And this is about testing your ideas. When you formulate a hypothesis, can you make predictions out of that hypothesis? Can you say, okay, if you're right, Mr. Harry Potter, people don't shower. Um, if we now um, you know, found a group of 30 Harry Potter people and 30 non-Harry Potter people, and we ask them how much they showered, uh, we should see a difference, right? You, you, you should be able to predict that the Harry Potter people will have showered less. Uh, so this leap between, okay, you got some great idea. Can you drive a prediction? Can you then test that prediction? If it holds up, that's cool. If it doesn't, then you have to refine, alter, expand. You start changing your theory. This is where the science happens. And, and according to scientists, this is where the refinement of, of the idea happens. The idea is over here and it's great, but it's a raw idea. And then we use science to see if it's right at all and how we can make it more right. Uh, and, and that's the sort of process of science and it involves a heavy use of predictions and experiments. Uh, and so really what defines something as a science uh, that they test their predictions associated with their ideas via ex experiments. Computer science is not a science. Political science is not a science. It's funny. It's sometimes the ones that are sciences don't feel the need to use the word science, like biology, physics, psychology. Um, they are all sciences. They use experiments heavily to get at the truth. Uh, and, and that is really what defines something as a science. So now if we go to the clinical side of things, Freud might not have been interested in testing ideas, but now more clinicians are. There are some clinicians still doing the Freud thing. They're, they're still, you know, seeing patients, giving therapy, and if the patient says everything's cool, that's great. Uh, there's a lot of those, but especially within academic settings, like here at UTSC, the clinicians here tend to be scientists as well. Uh, and so just to give you one taste, you know, we've talked about this notion that, hey, depressed people maybe weigh negative events too heavily. 
Um, and I think that's what causes them to feel so sad. They're focusing on the negative and not the positive. Can you develop a prediction? Well, yeah, if I could somehow make them pay more attention to the positive things, I would predict that would help their mood. Can you do that? Well, yeah, you know, we mentioned that idea of getting them to write down three good things that happen. So, so maybe we take two groups of people and half of them, we just say, do whatever you're normally doing. But the other half, we, we give them this task that at the end of the day, you have to tell us three good things. We think that'll make them focus on the good things more. And we think that'll make them feel better. And so if that's true, we'll gather the data and we'll test our predictions. And if that's true, that's great. If it's, if it's only sort of true, can we make it better? Can we understand, you know, do we need a better way of directing their attention, etc.? But this is the way now where we're actually saying, you know what, that therapy worked. It actually helped people based on something you can measure, you know, something specific and scientific. This is what clinical psychology is becoming. We are starting, this is what education is becoming as well, by the way. I could almost tell you the same story about education, that it used to be, you know, people just saying, this seems to make sense. But more and more, we're doing experiments and trying to find out what really works. That's what makes something a science. Um, and, and that's, you know, a critical step. And now because clinical psychology uh, has sort of gone down that route as well, it's kind of like these branches that branched off have come back together. Um, and now, you know, we're trying to understand the mind, both the, the sort of mind that's coping and the mind that's having challenges at the same time and using the same experimental approach to do that um, with both. Cool. With that said, let's go next to the people in your neighborhood. And I'm going to introduce you to some of these cognitive psychologists here at UTSC that are doing exactly what I've been describing. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. Bye-bye.